John's mother's ancestry line, 11th great-grandfather was King James I Saint slash sixth of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland. John's father's line, 32nd great-grandfather Emperor Charlemagne, by way of his daughter Retrude, then son, grandson, and great-grandsons to the surname established as Talifer in France. This held until about 1150 AD when parts of the family moved with William of Normandy to England in 1066 and changed their name to Taylor in Kent about 100 years later. The family arrived in Virginia around 1635 AD. John's line moved to West Virginia before the Revolutionary War in 1776, moved to Upton, Ohio onto Bounty Land around 1836, then onto the gold fields of California in 1849. Oregon homestead in the 1870s. John's grandfather died in a logging accident in 1913 on the Columbia River. The major wall in the trail until DNA proved the above connections in 2016. Talking to the family. Does everyone remember when I told you of being the many great grandsons and daughters of Charlemagne? John asked. They were waiting on going back to Omak after the battle with the Nanus. John was meeting with his family in the middle of the 665 called Tito. Lucy nodded, and Willie shook his head no. John, how many greats? Seth asked. I believe I am the 32nd, so the kids would be the 33rd great-grandchildren. Gaia and Matt, too. Willie, when we get home, I will tell you the story again. John got agreement all around, so he proceeded. Once upon a time, there was a great leader, and his name was Charlemagne. He lived in the 800s, so that was 1,200 years ago. He had a daughter named Retrude, and she had a son who had a son and so on. One of the great-grandsons made himself a sword. His name was Willie II, only in French. This sword protected his land so well that the family's name became Talafay. It means haver of iron. William Talafay was the Count of Angoulême. The ancient story that Amun Bible has tells of a family named Talafay that leads a backward planet to glory, and it brings the rule of law to the galaxy. John took a breath. There's more. Within the family is a very special birth. Jenny whispered, Gaia. John looked to Jenny and nodded his head. They have a major battle, their grand appearance to the galaxy, and no one on the Talifair side dies. John shared, they were up against enormous odds, but won anyway. Today, Seth said. John looked at Seth and nodded again. What do you think and feel? John asked. John, why did you put my son in the captain's seat? Inga asked. Because look around you. We accounted for 71 of the little ships and your son had a major effect on all five of the capital ships. If I saw that monster ship in a dream, I would call that a nightmare. Those of us that have experienced more than your son can list the number of minutes of that experience doing battle on two hands. John held up his fingers to make the effect more real. Now we need some toes, Willie said. Yes, Willie, we now need all of our toes too, John said and everybody laughed. So my son is going to be an Admiral James T. Kirk type? Inga laughed and looked at her son. John nodded, then looked at his family, one by one. What do you think? I could be a doctor on a big spaceship. Lucy said, my husband Brian and I could take our babies and go exploring. This brought a smile to Brian's face. His champion Lucy wanted him as a husband. Daddy, how many ships like this are ordered? Ben asked. Forty like this one, John answered. We also got 24 coming with the number 775 that will fly at light speed or faster. Inga asked, how fast will this ship fly? A million miles per hour. John shared, boys and girls, there is no right or wrong answer to my question. Let's talk more in the days ahead. This is more about what you feel and what you want. Thanks, Dad. It is a bit of a shock. We're just getting a handle on Earth with you as president and the subject has changed to the galaxy and space. Tony and Willow were both nodding their heads. I know. I think this has been coming to our world for a long time and the powers in charge have kept it hidden. I'm going to talk with the president of Lockheed, John said as he got up. John went over and sat down and turned to Mary Kennedy. I should have had you there in the meeting. It will be better to wait until Sam is there with me. Mary blushed. He's taking me to dinner. He settled the score for the loss of his sister. It no longer feels like an unfinished quest. He can move on now. He saw his chance as a way forward and he took it. He may be ready for marriage. 
I think that little strafing run needs to be taught to our young space program, John said. I concur, Mr. President. Mary smiled. I'm happy to share that the 29 ships that followed Sam were all of our top guns. John laughed with Mary. I truly like what you said. We live by the book until the first shot is fired. Then we fight to live. Mr. Locke calling White Eagle. The radio squawked. Mr. Locke, White Eagle here. It's working. The last 335 is working. All ships are green lighted. Let's go home. Kevin Humphreys was extremely excited. You and I can talk on the ride back, John suggested. Will do. Let me get off so the real people running the show can get us underway. Kevin Humphreys said, when we both get underway and you get a chance to sit down, give me a call. Ten quarters, John suggested. Will do, White Eagle. White Eagle to Mother Bear. We are going home. Let's do this, White Eagle. We will have the lights on and wait for your call on Friday. Mother Bear out. White Eagle out. Admiral, please take us home, John said. Will do, sir, Mary Kennedy said. Attention all U.S. ships, let's head for home. Let's go as a group and maintain 25,000 miles per hour. Admiral out. Tito, head for home. Maintain shields. Tito, please verify that everyone has pulled in behind us. Admiral Kennedy called the action. All ships accounted for, sir, Tito reported. Please do a damage assessment on all ships. Make up a report and send it to my email account, Tito, Mary directed. The two boys and Lucy were watching and listening intently. What did you learn today? Mary asked her students. You too, Ben. We will start with Willie. A lot of people are not going home, Willie said. War is not nigh. God says we have a right to protect ourselves. You do that very well. Are you a good shot? Mary asked. Very good. Willie said, we fly home. Willie, a good solder wants no more war because often someone dies. Sometimes friends, sometimes family. Willie looked to Lucy and Ben and nodded his head. Yes, sir. Calling White Eagle, this is Mr. Locke. Mary handed the mic to John. White Eagle here. White Eagle, what an amazing day. We learned a ton of stuff, and we may need to run the ships through our plant in Texas to make the modifications to them. Certainly the 335s and the 445s, for sure. How many times did your 665 get hit? Kevin Humphreys asked. Bulldog says 34 times, John answered as he counted the fingers from Mary. Did you notice anything like the dimming of the lights or flashing? Kevin asked. No, we did notice a minor vibration each time, but it did not interfere with shields cloak or lights or Tito. John replied, my stomach telling me I was hungry rumbled more. On two occasions, we got hit twice at almost the same time and we got two or three seconds of shutting down then a quick restart. We need a way to ground the burst from the energy weapons, Kevin shared. We need a bucket of wet sand with a lightning rod connected to it, John said. It may be that simple or something we can store energy in then tap into when we fire back. It would always be of help if our energy weapons had an extra 10 or 20% kick to them. Kevin was thinking aloud. How does the 665 take so many hits and we hardly feel a thing? Where the 445S or 335S get knocked out? John asked. John, the energy plant for the shields and cloaking on the 665 is as big as an entire 335? Kevin laughed. That's how that's possible. Then we need to figure out how to make the energy plant smaller, John stated. We're working on that, John. Kevin laughed. Question, would you want them half as big or twice as powerful? For the ships we have, twice as powerful. We may face an enemy where they have continued to make progress and are thousands of years ahead of us instead of being frozen at a level of advancement for whatever reason for tens of thousands of years ago, John stated. You notice that too. That big ship was for show, and as a little dog, we didn't know enough to leave it alone. Kevin shared, We have to remember, your 335S and 445S, sir, can sink battleships 10 and 20 miles away. Those capital ships were not hardened as they should have been. A very good lesson for us to remember, John said. The way we are building is the 445 has six times the power of the 335. The 665 has 100 times the power of the 445. 
The design on the 775 is 100 times more power than the 665, and yet it will have room for only 25 crew. Kevin shared, it is being designed for long range. Will it have a seat for me? John asked. Only if you are going exploring around the galaxy. Kevin laughed. Anything else to add, Kevin? John asked. The 775 will have six six lasers pointing forward that can be controlled by one or more people that will reach out 30 to 40 miles, Kevin added. Thank you, Kevin. I'll sleep better tonight. John laughed. I'll talk to you again soon. Oh, by the way, when will we see the 775? We have been waiting on seats so we could finish our testing, White Eagle. We hope to have that little issue resolved ASAP, Kevin said. Let me know if there is anything I can do for you, John said. Is it okay to take someone to the sun and throw them over the handrail? Kevin laughed. Probably not a good idea. John laughed. Okay, we will think of something else then. Kevin also laughed. Ten quarters White Eagle. John sat there for a minute holding the mic thinking. You think we went up against old technology? Mary asked. In a way, yes. Can you imagine your F-18 built on a Wright Brothers concept? That mankind did not advance after they died either because of no funding for research or somebody in power thought what we had was good enough? Where would we be today? Look what the old government did in squelching this very ship that we are in. I think that is something that happened to the Nanooks, that Dreadnought should have had a cannon that when fired, it would have knocked 10 or 20 of our ships out of commission and possibly killing everyone on board all of them. John stated. So it was no big thing winning this battle today? Mary was frowning. Willie, have you hit a ball with a bat yet? John asked. No, Daddy, I'm still too little. Willie said, I'm still learning how to throw. Mary, we've been to bat twice, once in Antarctica where we hit a home run. Then today we hit a grand slam. What I am asking is what are the chances of Willie hitting two home runs in his first two at bats? John laughed. We have our work ahead of us to prepare for the next time we have to bat. It may not be pretty. You are concerned that not all of us may come home, oh, or I get to Mary asked. You are getting close. My concern is the next bad guy out there may do to us what we did to the Nan Nukes today. That dreadnought had many times the weight and should have had many times the firepower of everything we had in space today. John looked around at a lot of white faces. Willie, what would you do if you hit two home runs the first two times you got up to bat? John asked. Cookies and ice cream, party? Willie said very enthusiastically. John looks to Mary. Thank you for our lives today. You get an A triple plus from this boss. John smiled. Now are there any cookies left? Willie reached out with a plate with one cookie on it. I don't want to take the last cookie, John said. Brian showed him another plate with five cookies on it. Okay, I'll eat this last cookie. John looked around. Everyone was at the windows in the little jump seats. They were eating cookies and drinking something and enjoying flying through space and talking to those still around them. John looked up. Thank you, Father, for our survival today. He heard, you're welcome, son. Mary and Jenny were talking. Jenny asked a question. You're thinking of the Enterprise on Star Trek? That level of technology for sure. The Nanooks should have been there, but something stopped them. The people in charge likely felt they had good enough equipment and wouldn't spend any more money. John thought for a minute. It also may have been because people could get anything they wanted without working. John and Jenny locked eyes. The money would become obsolete in two years or less. The question was, would people still show up and do the jobs needed? They certainly did today. The only paid space people were Mary Kennedy and the 29 Top Gun teachers and students from the Navy. John laughed. He was certain that the 29 Top Guns had followed Sam on his wild stunt of cutting the dreadnought up, would have done that for free any day of the week. Jenny started laughing. Mary asked, First Lady, what is funny? John was thinking that all the people that were here today were volunteers except for you and the 29 students and teachers at the Top Gun School. Then he thought those crazy Top Gun guys would do that any day of the week for free. Jenny giggled. Mary too. I agree. Me too, First Lady. Mary giggled. We made it back and all the ships were put into their proper place. 
Omak time was 4.35 p.m. John realized the Marines needed to be fed. Sam and Mary Kennedy were hugging and kissing. I think Sam impressed her. They gave John a look, a salute, and headed off. Listen up. Anyone that would like to join us, we will be at Sow's at 5 p.m. for dinner at my big table in the southwest corner. John announced, anyone that needs transportation back to town, gather around me. Everybody here, take a big deep breath of air. The transport happened. The natives noticed, but there were many big eyes from the newbies, looking around wondering how in the hell did that happen? Jenny and the kids moved towards the front door to Sue's. Anyone that needs a place to sleep tonight gathers around me. John did an inventory, then once again said, everybody here, take a big deep breath of air. The transport happened, and now they were in front of the Omak Hotel. John went to the front door and opened it. This way, please. John had given them a heads up at the hotel, and April and her husband and two others were there taking registrations for the party. The Marines allowed First Lady Tripp and her son to get registered first. They went up to their room and did a quick inspection. John and First Lady Tripp, once they were back down, sat in the lobby and waited for the Marines to sign in. How much do the rooms go for here? Inga asked. Before the Earth changes $60, $80 and $100. Single occupancy, it's the best hotel in the city. John said with a straight face, of course it is the only one. Now the rates are $6, $8 and $10. Only one hotel? Inga asked. No, forgive me. I get a little silly after winning a major space battle. We have 10 hotels, but either the owners lived elsewhere or were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The county had an ordinance to confiscate all land and buildings especially banks and hotels in an emergency that were vacant or without an apparent owner. I had been here two days and I get voted in as the temporary county executive. We opened those nine hotels and put homeless Seattleites in them. They still have some people in them. April and her husband run all the facilities from here. They have volunteers in every hotel taking care of the places. John smiled. So in a way, this is the only one we still have functioning. This summer, we plan on making it available for the out-of-town guests of Congress. And the Okanagan tribe will have their hotel and casino done, and we will be putting many hundreds of people in there. We are building a five-star hotel over by the new Capitol building. They are ahead of schedule. They have the roof on. They may get her done before June. When is the Congress meeting? Inga asked. Starting June 1st, and we will go until we are done for the year. We have to be out of the building when school starts again in the fall. John said, can you vote on things when you are out of session? Inga asked. Yes, we have a blog and right now we have two threads going, one for spaceships and the other one just started as the Congressional Medal of Honor for all those that fought at the White House. The Speaker of the House runs the blog and he decides when we need to call for a vote. I have asked for the last word on both issues even though I don't get to vote. John answered, I do sign the bills. We just had a vote on Tuesday, January 9th. I have won the popular vote with 87%. Your husband has some loyal voters. He got 12% and there were a few write-in candidates. I'm happy to say I carried every state. John said in a neutral voice, although I find it disturbing to have 12% of all Americans think a dead man could do a better job than me. Don't get caught up in the BS, sir. I'm glad for you, John. You have a mandate from the people. Dar didn't have that until the proof of almost 21 million illegal votes for the opposition was exposed. Inga said, 10 million hit the streets wanting law and order. People were so fed up with the privilege, able to get away with murder in the streets and nothing was done. John said, John, you don't know this, but the counterintelligence division of the FBI planned every one of those school shootings for the last five or 10 years. Inga was almost choked because of the emotional attachment to the idea. Let's see, counterintelligence equals sign propaganda equals sign lying to the public. That's as easy as a man teaches his dog to bit strangers, then wonders why the dog bits his children. John shook his head. Dar had this plan. It had to be over 1,000 pages. Part of the plan was to get rid of the FBI, CIA, and the Federal Reserve. He was also going to trim 4 million federal employees. He said once when an organization reaches a point, it no longer serves the people, but serves the organization only. 
then it needs to go. Amen to that. We have a building with 10 accountants and 20 clerks making payroll for the armed services. That reminds me, I need to put you and the Marines on the payroll tomorrow morning. Oh, oh, John said when he looked up. April was coming towards John and she looked fit to be tied. I just heard that you went off on your own into space all by yourself today and should have been killed. You dope. John turned to Inga. I don't think she voted for me. Yes, I voted for you, but what if you get yourself killed? What good does that do us, Uncle John? April was upset. And why pick a fight for no reason? John was up in a heartbeat hugging his favorite niece as she cried her eyes out. Inga was standing next to them, softly rubbing April's back. Inga, this is my favorite niece, April. April, this is First Lady Inga Tripp. Inga and Jenny went with me. John whispered the last. Very nice to meet you, First Lady. April had wiped her eyes with her hand and curtsied. I hope we can make your stay here wonderful. April gave John a dirty look. Honey, remember Belinda? John knew this was going to be explosive. Belinda disappeared three years ago. April asked him to go to the memorial gathering they had for her on the first anniversary of her disappearance. Yes, what does that have to do with space beings from Nanix? April was still fighting angry. Remember when she disappeared? You said it didn't make any sense. John held her away and looked into her eyes. The Nanooks may have taken Belinda and four to five million humans for food every year. John's eyes opened wide and looked at Inga. That dreadnought was not a battleship. It was a food processor. That's why it had so little teeth. What's with the teeth? April asked. You're right, John. That's the reason it was so easy. It was not a war fleet. It was a food gathering trip. Inga then went, yuck, they knew we would be easy. I don't understand, April said. The 1,200 ships we stopped from Nanooks were here to pick up food. They eat us, they eat humans. John thought April was going to pass out. Many of the Marines had signed in and were waiting and listening. They were quietly talking to each other. John directed April to sit in the chair where he had been sitting in. Her husband, Brad, was there in a heartbeat. Inga was sitting again next to her, asking her if she was all right. Brad whispered, did she tell you? John could only guess, no. He whispered back, we're going to have a baby, Brad whispered, then bent to ask April if she needed a glass of water. Uncle John, please forgive me and thank you for taking care of that damn nom nux for us. You're welcome, April. Inga has been working on our missing people for a while. Thank her too, John said. Thank you, First Lady. April took a deep breath. I'm okay now. This world should be safer for you and your baby. Inga smiled. We're family. Call me Inga. Thank you, April smiled. Everyone checked in, John asked, when he heard nothing back. Let's go eat dinner. John and Inga led the way over to Sue's. There were all the members of his family except for Johnny and Teresa. Chuck and Beth had been in one of the other 445s and had taken the place as wingmen for the 665 when Sam pulled his stunt. John called up his son Johnny and invited him and Bill and their wives to join the party. They were on the way. His four Marines were also there and John had them sit at the table and have dinner. He asked them if they knew any of the other Marines. Soon they were sharing stories and locations of service in hometowns. Sam and Mary had also joined them. John looked at Sam and Sam made a very small head movement that gave John the indication he had not asked for Mary's hand in marriage yet. John had also called Peter, and with Patty, they had also joined the gathering. When George came up to take the order, John asked, how are you set for lobsters? We have too many, 10 or 12, I believe. George added, and we get more tomorrow. Cook all of them, eight for dinners, then take all the rest and cut into sampler size pieces for all to have a sample, John suggested. We will. And you, sir? The usual? Yes, and bring us six bottles of champagne and six bottles of sparkling cider. We are celebrating our unbelievable massive win over the alien race that has been taking our people for their food. Thank you, sir. My family and sisters are safer. The lobsters came and there was enough for everyone to have at least a quarter of a lobster with their meal. The girls all laughed. Even Lucy and Willie had a quarter of a lobster to dip into butter. John said a prayer of thanks when he toasted to their win. He sat down and looked at Sam. 
Sam caught his look, and John leaned his head to his left with this little smile on his face. Sam nodded and pushed the chair back and got on one knee. Mary was talking to Lucy and didn't notice Sam's actions. Lucy, I like lobster, but what is the big deal about lobster? Mary asked. In our family, lobster means love. I wonder who... Lucy noticed Sam on one knee and stopped talking. Oh, ho. When Mary saw Sam on one knee with a little black box in his hand, she started nodding her head even before he said anything. Sam didn't know it, but Mary was pretty sure she was pregnant. Her monthly cycle came with the full moon, and the next full moon wasn't that far away. She was pretty sure she caught just before Christmas. Mary, will you have me for your husband? Sam asked. It was easy since Mary was already nodding her head yes. Have our children? Forever and ever, Mary said. I love you. Lucy was standing on her buster, and it started to slip. She blinked, and in that blink, she transported hitting John in his chest. Ah! John closed his arms automatically around Lucy. He was standing as he was going to lead a toast to the new couple. Willie was dancing in his high chair. Daddy, turn so I can see! Lucy directed, hurry! John turned so he was facing Jenny, who was also standing with her glass of sparkling cider. Sam carefully slipped the ring onto Mary's ring finger. He stood and pulled Mary up with him. Mary was holding up her hand for all to see as she kissed Sam. Oh, kisses take forever, Lucy said, when the couple finally separated. I propose a toast to the new couple. Everyone here that has been here for more than a day knew this day was coming. We all love both of you and wish you the absolute best. From both Sam and Mary, thank you, John. Thank all of you. Any other wonderful and loving announcements? John asked. John could hear you tell him. And okay. John or Dad and Jenny, we want you to be the godparents to our baby, Peter said. Jenny yelled, yeah, and ran as fast as a ninth month pregnant woman can around the table to give her stepsister Patty a hug. Mary had also moved to meet Patty coming from the other direction. Sally, Willa, and even Inga moved to hug Patty. John looked over at Sam and gave him a thumbs up. When do you think you conceived? Jenny asked. Just before Christmas, Patty answered. OMG, Mary said. All the ladies looked at her. Sam! Everybody, including Sam, looked in the direction of Mary. You're going to be a daddy too. Sam jumped about a foot. Yes! Sam looked at a wondering Willie. I'm going to be a daddy, Willie. Willie looked at his dad, holding his sister. Then he looked at Jenny. More babies, he said to himself. Someday I'll be a daddy too. Willie sat back down and went back to work on his chunk of lobster. John brought Lucy back and helped her back on top of her buster seat that was in an ordinary chair. Lucy, would you be more comfortable in a chair like Willie has? Yes, daddy, Lucy said. I'll get more chairs. John looked around. Can I help John? George Locke asked. Any more high chairs? John asked. No, sir. There seems to be a population explosion. In the last month, we have ordered 50 and have only gotten 20. They are out there. I saved Willie's chair in that locked closet, George said. We must be doing something right, George. John patted the young man on the back. They poured the foundations for the two additional buildings for the fish hatchery today. George said with a big smile. They are modernizing the cannery right now. They will be running it 24 hours a day, seven days a week starting August 1st, and will continue until Christmas, then 16 hours, five days a week until they run out of things to can. We are building a walk-in freezer that will be 8,000 square feet in size in the building next door. The only thing that won't be changed is the roof. We will be able to produce enough food for everybody in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and part of Utah for a year. John said, with other food sources, we may see our food north into Canada, south into Mexico, and throughout the Western US. Next summer, we are working on making the cannery three times bigger. John was excited. Thanks, George. The ladies were returning to their lobsters. This is exactly what we needed a safe, loving environment where Inga stopped and looked at each of the Marines, Chet, and her son, where we can make a difference and contribute to the good things that are going on here. We are making all of mankind safer on this planet. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you again for bringing closure to what happened to my husband. Inga smiled big. 
I feel we may have lost our president, but we won that war because of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have wondered when Alfred Sori's name would show up. He did many evil things just because he could. He hired many thousands of demonstrators, and when he stopped paying them, many of the demonstrations also stopped. Funny how that seemed to work. His name was connected to many deaths, and at least 16 color revolutions causing governmental changes around the world. I agree with First Lady Tripp, we have lost a great leader, but we have won the war because of you. And because of your actions, we are all much safer from the actions of an extremely sick and delusional man. Thank you.